Amen, amen. Ushers, you may serve the people. If you're happy and you know it. Come on, come on. Say amen. Say amen. If you're happy, if you're happy and you know it, and you know it. Say amen. Amen. When the spirit, when the spirit lives in you, makes you shout hallelujah. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. Let's go to the night and on the time. Happy, happy in Jesus. Happy. Come on, Sopranos. Happy. Jesus Christ, happy in 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 Jesus Christ, when, when the Spirit lives in you, makes you shout, when the Spirit, when the Spirit lives in you, makes you shout, when the spirit, when the spirit lives in you, makes you shout. If you're happy, if you're happy and you know it, 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 say amen. Come on in here. Long way back. All you people. Hallelujah. Take God. Let the voice of triumph shout. Amen. 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 Shout. Shout. Shout like you. Amen. Hallelujah. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. Say if you're happy and you know it. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. Amen. When the spirit lives in you, when the spirit. Spirit is in you, make you shout, 
hard places in your life if nobody's pleased with you but him you can rest assured the joy that he has with the fact that you are standing by faith in the grace in which he has given us to stand when the spirit of God lives in you Make you shout hallelujah. When the spirit, whose spirit's in you? What spirit's in you? The spirit of fear? Spirit of being, dying alone? Fear of old age? Fear of death itself? Fear of being alone. Fear of loss. But when the Spirit of God lives in you, and if you're happy with Jesus alone, and you know it, if you're happy with the Spirit of God living in you, and you know it, you're going to say amen. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is no unclean thing. And the presence of the Lord will drive out all fear of it, whatever fear it is. And if you have any fears of any kind today, ask the Lord to fill you with more of His love because perfect love will drive that thing out. Love Him some more, love Him some more. Just ask Him to put some more love in you. Eventually and over time, every fear that you will ever have will soon leave your life. Make your shout. Hallelujah. When the Spirit lives in you, not visits every now and then, when you feel good, but if He lives in you, Hallelujah. If you're happy and you know it, <laughs> if you're happy and you know it, if you're happy and you know it, say amen. 
Amen. Let the church say amen. If you're happy and you know it, go ahead. Say amen. Say amen. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. Say amen. With the spirit, with the spirit, with the spirit. thank you for this time together around your word to worship you in spirit and in truth through song and dance we praise you and we honor you with the fruit of our lips the sacrifice of our praise that we offer to you a prayer of thanksgiving we ask you for a special word of wisdom how to grow in grace and the knowledge of the lord jesus christ and of you who are is our savior we do honor you and we praise you for this time together in the name of the lord jesus christ and everybody said amen say amen again Say the man again. Last Sunday, Matthew chapter 22 and verse 29, Matthew 22 and verse 29 says, Jesus answered and said unto his disciples, and the Pharisees primarily, you are sadly mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Matthew 22 and 29, Jesus answered and said to them, you are, you are mistaken not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. I say it like this. We make mistakes because unfortunately we don't know the scriptures. And we don't know the scriptures because we come to church regularly but we have nobody to teach us. We have some teachers but they teach about, the, teach about things. They teach about God. They don't teach God the knowledge of God. And so we're mistaken not knowing the scriptures and of course, you're responsible for your own education, your own spiritual education. And therefore, because you don't know the scriptures, it is almost impossible for you to take advantage of the availability of the power that is of God. There's a power that is available. We call it the power of God. We say it real, we say it real quickly. We say it glibly. We say it without thinking about it. But it is the power that is as if it's the power of God who created the heavens and the earth, who no one has seen, nor can anyone prove he exists. 
they cannot see him and still be alive physically <clears throat> because flesh and blood cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So he who would come up to God must believe that God exists. The creator, whoever created the heavens and the earth, the water, the clouds, the sky, us, the trees, and everything that you see, whoever he is created everything that we see. So then he created that, and if we're going to come to him, because you can't see him, therefore you come to him by what is called faith. And without faith, just believing, faith is to be firmly persuaded with this idea. It's an idea. God is an idea. I can't prove to you that he exists. But the existence of God is an idea. I can't, if I have something that I, I t tell you exists and I can't prove it to you, at the present time, it's only an idea. And you believe the idea and then you, the, and you believe in the idea and as you work the idea, the, it's, it does work. It is true. It really works. So then faith in God is the idea that God exists. So we believe God exists. So it is, faith is the means to be firmly persuaded with this idea that you have hope, that is confident expectation. It is the idea of hope and certain expectation. Certain expectation with something that you can't even see. And so God manifests himself through a prophet called Jesus Christ who believed so much in this idea. He became as the son of God with the divine nature of God who died and came a first responder. As the Son of God, he said, he shall be called the Son of God, for he shall save the people. And the idea that someone can save you and you cannot see them is called faith. So faith in God is you must come unto God, you must believe that he exists, and because you believe he exists, then to you he is a rewarder of those who diligently what? Seek, Seek him using their faith. Not how you're feeling, not your emotions, not your singing, not your praying, not your jumping, but your believing. Okay? Now, belief, believing is a verb. The word is pistis. It is the same word for faith. Faith is a noun, believe is a verb, but it's the same word. For example, we, we have four of these words that we use. One is we call, um, the one that we came up with the other day. Just to justify. If, if you do something that I am pleased with, I say, you're right with me. That's what we, you're justified with me. I'll defend you. I'll stand up for you because you what? Justified. I justified you with what you did. You, what you did uh, said to me or made you right with me. That's justified. So you're justified to do certain things and live a certain way to me. Now, using as a noun, it says you're righteous. So justification is a verb or to justify, I am being justified, or I am righteous, or I am justified, or I am just, justification is a noun. So the verb is justify, uh, 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 and uh, the noun is justification, and the noun is righteous, righteousness, but it's a verb and a noun. Just like you get cook is one word as a verb, but then when it turns into a noun, you get chef. You get the word, a, a verb, you get the word uh, Mr. Mark, Hamadalos. When it turns into a noun, you get the word sinner. Most of the Bible talks about people in about, that talk about sinners, but Jesus never called anybody about sinners. He said, I came to save those people who y'all keep calling sinners. That's basically what he said. And sinner means to miss the mark. It's easier to take a pill when you just miss the mark, but it's something totally different when you change what they do from missing the mark to renaming who they are and just rename them as a sinner. That's a real thing. That's like the, uh, we can be in a verb, we can be uh, uh, African Americans, you might say, but then to change our the reference to a noun and say that's the, you're the in, the in word. So you change your from your, your uh, uh, national origin or, or your, Afri your uh, descent, uh, ethnic, ethnic origin, to that of a, uh, an N-word which shows contempt. So you get justify and then righteous. You get a cook. You get chef. You get Mr. Mark. You get a sinner. And there's one more. Um, Mr. Mark, sinner, righteous. Anyway, 
So I kind of stopped using the word sinners. You, when you really want to get to somebody, you can just say, listen, you, 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 you've been living together. You, 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 you've, been, you, you've been doing this here so long. You're not just missing the mark. You've turned into a sinner. That's kind of what's going on. So I don't think God wants us to judge people like that. Would you, would you agree? So he says you're mistaken because you don't know the scriptures. And you don't know the scriptures, therefore you can't take advantage of the power of God. So last Sunday, uh, one of these times was, uh, Karen and I donated some money to the ministry here at Christ Community. And on, a handout, I, on that handout, line 41, on, if you all have, still have from last week, there was a campaign contribution on that handout line 41 to a pastor. This pastor is a member of the church here. This pastor is, is running for an office, a political office, and is an elder here in the ministry. And uh, I made a statement near the end of the service when I pointed out line 41 as a contribution. I said that we buy everything we need. We ought to buy us a politician. And so everybody, if, if, you, if you had a mind, many of you well, they went negative. Anytime you buy a politician, it means corruption, it means dishonesty, it means they're crooks, it means anything. When you don't know the scriptures, you will always be negative. We are sadly mistaken, Jesus said, because you don't know the scriptures. And because you don't know the scriptures, you can't take advantage of the power of God. So we had some shouts from our, our tender souls. You can't buy nobody. And I, I you know... In the last, I said, oh, yes, you can, but, the, you know, you don't have time to explain it. Well, you could have explained it better, whatever the case might be. So I, I said this to someone. I said, I'll tell you what. How many of y'all got jobs where you have worked in the past or work now for 40 hours a week? Okay. When you go on that job, is that time yours? You work for the, per you for, for the company, right? Uh, so they bought, how, did, they bought your time, right? For about 40 hours, right? They bought you. You aren't going to use your cell phone. You're going to use an email for personal use. They bought you. Now, I know we don't like to think like that. But it happens all the time. Everybody is bought. So when you say, well, you're buying a politician, it's always negative. Well, I want to show you something this morning to help you out. Because there are two natures in the child of God. That's the old nature. Paul said, when I desire to do good, Evil is always present with me. That's what he says. Not just evil is always present, but evil is always present with me. And so, Ephesians, uh, Colossians chapter 10 and verse 5. Colossians chapter 10 and verse 5. Solomon is speaking and he talks about life on the planet. He calls it life under the sun. So another word or reference or metaphor or an example of living on earth is life under the sun. So the Bible says There's an, there is an evil I have seen under the sun as an error proceeding from the ruler. Then he drops down to verse 10. So verse 10 says, if the axe is dull. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to that. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 5, if the axe is dull. What did I say? Did I say Colossians? Ecclesiastes. No wonder y'all ain't seen them. Thank you, thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you, brother. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 10 now. Ecclesiastes 10, verse... Not that one, that's not it. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse number 5. It says, if the axe is dull, you can read with me, and one does not chopping, sharpen the edge then he must use more strength. You got that? 10-10. Ten, ten. Ecclesiastes 10-10. Ten, ten. Please take that screen down unless we're using it. That one. Okay. If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use what? More strength. Now, I want you to hold on to this because I'm, trying, I'm going somewhere this morning. I want, I want to take you with me. I want to take you where I am. So, well, I, I came back to get you. Okay? So, if the axe is dull, and no one, what? And, and, and no one does not, what? Sharpen the edge of the axe. 
then whoever is using the axe must use the most strength. Have you ever tried to cut something, cut something with a dull knife? It's just, you just have to press down and it really doesn't cut it. Then you have to punch a hole in it and try to work from there. And so, but wisdom brings success. So I want to talk to you about a little wisdom now about the things that you buy. All right? That's not the title, but I want to talk to you. Black folks seem to have a dull axe. And the dull axe is that they want somebody else to sharpen their own axe. Black folks seem to have a dull axe. I'll say it again. Black folks seem to have a dull axe that they want somebody else to sharpen. It's your axe. You need to sharpen your own axe. Verse 19 of the same chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, drop down to verse number 19. A feast is made for laughing. That's why we're laughing, doing praise and worship. We're just enjoying the, the feast on the, the knowledge of God that we do have and we're enjoying his presence, singing. And wine will make you happy before it makes you sleepy. <laughs> but here is the thing. But money answers everything. Underline that in your Bible if you got it. Money answers everything. Money answers everything. Well, now, is that the truth? He just told you in verse number five, there is an evil I have seen under the sun. So we're talking about life where? Here. Money answers everything where? Here. Are you listening? So don't get it confused. But money answers everything here. All right. Now we got it. All right. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 16. Now we know that money going to answer us, money's gonna, and money answers, and I, I don't know why we wouldn't believe it. Because as long as y'all work, as hard as y'all work, as much as you scrimped up and saved and worked hard, I don't, why, I don't know why you don't believe it'll work, uh, it'll work for you. If you're working for something you don't believe going to work for you, you're crazy. So I know we're not crazy. But our unbelief and our tradition and what we've been taught down through the years kind of Hit us, right? We just can't, we can't reconcile it too because we're spiritual. We have, we have been taught to be balanced when it comes to living the life that we have here and being born again of the Spirit of God. You got two. You got two natures in the child of God. Matthew chapter 28 verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. Verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Like we did this morning. Here's the caveat but some of them what some of them didn't believe it they did some of y'all won't believe what I'm telling you but I know it works and I'm going to show you why and how but some doubt it and Jesus came and spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name or the authority how can you baptize somebody in somebody's name is the, the authority the influence the resource and the fellowship of being what it means to be with God the Father and being with the Son and having him in your heart and having the Holy Spirit confirm his presence in your life as the Son of the living God living in you that's what it means to be baptized we used to baptize them we're gonna baptize you almost three times we're gonna baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit what we didn't we know we we're baptizing the flesh which is an outward sign that you publicly identify but your mind didn't change and your attitude was the same and you didn't believe none of it. You didn't believe in healing. You didn't believe in salvation. You didn't believe in deliverance. You didn't believe in that God can heal you everywhere you hurt. You didn't believe in overcoming all of the issues that you have had all your life and you was old and you still full problems as if they just happened last week. What good is baptism? So baptizing you in the name of the Father, it doesn't mean in the water because the water can't wash away what you got. The only thing that can wash away is your understanding of the authority, power, influence, and fellowship. But what it means is all as if you've been baptized in the name of God. And it changed your life, my friend. When you come to the point where you believe you've been baptized in the name of God the Father. 
and of his son who lives in your heart, Jesus, through by faith. And the Holy Spirit living. And you've been baptized. It changes your life. That's what it really means. So that's just one side of the coin. The other side is how you're going to live it out. Somebody said, well, you go down a dry devil, you just come up a wet one. So the church is in the business where God's values are carried into the marketplace. Look at chapter, Luke chapter 19 and verse 13. Luke chapter 19 and verse 13. Here Jesus gave every, called ten people together, gave each one of them a minor or a talent apiece. He said, do business until I come. Everybody start off with the same 24 hours a day. Everybody start off with the same equal. You say, well, in my life, things have not been, I didn't, I didn't have a silver spoon. I didn't have a rich family in my life. I didn't have a, uh, anybody to give me a hand up. I didn't have anybody to give me a hand out. And so you, we all, if you're, if you're not careful, in your mind, you will victimize yourself. You make yourself a victim. I just recall when I was young, I didn't, my mom died when I was two. I flunked the fifth grade. Our house was torched when, we, when I was seven. And then I flunked the fifth grade when I was 10 going on 11. Then the lady died who in that false home. She was killed in a car wreck. And I, I, I was feel fine. Children are resilient. They don't even know it. They just know something. that happened. They know this happened. They know that happened. It is not until you get to be about 15, 17, 20, when you hear a whole lot of people talking, you know what, your mama died. Do you know you didn't have no mama? And then you hear all these other folk talking about, well, you know, you flunked to feel great. And you know what that means? That means you're dumb. You know what that means? And they, they, you get to, they're talking about your past and how you went through. And now you begin to take on somebody else's unimaginable hurts about your own self. And now you victimize yourself with what they done told you. But your children are resilient. They don't remember half the stuff y'all think they remember. And if you leave it alone, it'll just go on and it'll, it'll never, they would never download it. They never realized they went through it. But we tell them, you know, your parents divorced when you was two. They'll t we'll tell them all the stuff. And by the time we shape them with our words and tell them so many things, they start feeling like that. Why? Because your words trigger how you feel. You feel a certain way based on when you tell yourself. And people start telling you that, you begin to feel that way. You can talk right now. And start talking to yourself about something, somebody pissed you off 10 years ago. And you start talking about it right now, you get mad all over again, just like it happened just, like this, just 10 minutes ago. And you get so mad, your blood pressure will go up right here, right here this morning. You can come up here and testify and say, let me tell you what happened 12 years ago. Such and, such. and you start telling it, and you start crying all over again like, like it just happened. Because your emotions are triggered by your thought life. And the Bible says, as far as a man so keep on thinking in his heart, that's where his life's going to be. So you've got to be renewed in your mind. So Jesus called these ten of his servants together, delivered to them each one, one apiece, ten minors, and said to them, y'all need to do business until I come. The church has taken Matthew 28 and going into all the world to preach the gospel, but they have left the other great commission in Luke chapter 19 and verse 13, where it says, why, why are you going into to all the world and preaching the gospel? Make sure you do some business. You need to have some business. Okay. You need to do some business. Uh, we thought they meant get a job. So we'll quote 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. If a man doesn't work, see, y'all got that one. So instead of having a business, we meant go get your job. And what do we tell our children as they're growing up? You need to, you're going to have to go up and get you a what? A job. You need to go to college so you can get you a job. We never mention what? Start a business. Black folk have a closely guarded community secret. It is a known fact that when it comes to buying and selling, how many of you are familiar with the quote? You all know what I'm going to say? It begins with black folks. Black folk buy what they want. And bar and big, see, we don't even want to say it. Yeah, I've never said this in this pulpit. As a people, because of what we've gone through, we have a misplaced value system. 
that the church leaders have not really dealt with. And then when we really had a, a horde of people following in the, under the influence of church, of the ministry, we missed it. So as a culture of people, black folk buy what they want and they borrow or either beg for what they need. In his book, the great book of the Bible, God provides answers to questions you didn't even know you had. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says, 2 Peter 1 3 says, as his divine power, comprehending and embracing what it means to be in Christ Jesus, God has given us all things. He has given us all things that pertain to life and God. I got it all. Say, I got it. it. Say, God has given me everything I need need. to live the life that he wants me to have. have. He has given us all things that pertain to life and God. That's why you have to believe if you, he will come unto God must come to him by what? Faith. And believe you receive it. Now therefore, he has given us, if you believe it, he has given you wisdom. He said, but you, that's the only thing you ask for is wisdom. But he has given you, you have the faith. He says, add these things to you. I'll come to that in a moment. He said, but you need to add some things to your faith that you have in God. All right. Now Dr. Claude Anderson, who was a black educator and he was here in the, the Department of Education in Florida, and he worked in the Jimmy Carter uh, administration under, in the U.S. Department of Commerce, believes that black Americans should build a five-story building. We need to build a five-story building. When I grew up in this town, up and down MLK, and every city across this country, there was a black Wall Street. Black Wall Street was consisted of black-owned businesses run by black folk who owned the businesses, who sold commodities to other black folk, who made products, who then hired uh, those who were who sold things to other black folk, they then hired black folks, and hired the black folk that they hired had some other black folk working for them, and the money turned over from one black hand to another hand six or seven or eight times. That's right. That's right. But in 1929, I think it was 1929, when the Black Wall Street in Tulsa destroyed the black population, and then we thought, oh, we need to be integrated. We really, you know, we get these old textbooks from Lakeland High School. We get these old computers and calculators from these other schools around here. So what we need to do, we don't need to get new ones and fight for new ones. We just need to uh, integrate and go there. So in the process of integration, instead of keeping a concentration of economic power, which is what we had, pharmacies, grocery stores, doctors, attorneys, all up and down the street, all up and down here. This was self, because you, you couldn't go nowhere else. We had everything that we needed right here. But then we wanted integration. We want, well, we, want, we, want to, we want to get some cold water from downtown. We want, to get some, we want to be integrated and be able to go downtown. So what we did was we said we want to get integrated. So we left the black schools, which are predominantly black schools, of course. Then the school boards didn't like the idea. Then the state road department didn't like the idea. The city fathers and a whole lot of other decisions made came to widen the street and plow down every business down there. That was another black wall street here in Lakeland. They just didn't use fire. They used widening of the highway. And it happened everywhere but in Greensboro where Dudley High School is still in, in place. They integrated it, but they did it because A&T is their college, A&T, University, uh, what is it, North Carolina A&T. North Carolina A&T State University is right there in, in Greensboro, right down the street from where Carol lived. Then the professors and, and all of the college professors and the, the power in the, in the community and Jesse Jackson and them fought. The city, remember the city in? It was in Greensboro. And they fought and kept the school. Her class had 350, 350 in the graduating class. That was a big school in the black community. And it was all black folk in a university town. So we lost that. So he said, we need to build. Uh, so we thought what happened is, we, well, we, need to get, we need to go to the white school, which is fine. I'm not, please don't, don't get me. Go to the white, because I have some white friends. But we need, to go, we need to go to the white schools. We need to go and be able to eat downtown. We need to go. We had Miles Cafe. We had a whole lot of, of good. They turned. But we started. We wanted to go somewhere else. 
And what happened is we ended up going to these other places and then we fractured our community. And, and uh, then the money that was turning over, two or three hands, stopped turning over. When we worked in the, the white food that you did work for, you got the money from the white hand, that green money. Instead of putting it in the black hand, you turned around right around and gave it to another, another white man. And that's what happened to all of our communities. It's just the way it is. So he says, Dr. Claude Anderson says, you need to build, we need to build, See, but now we don't have, we don't have in the black Wall Streets, we don't have a concentration of a black community. There's no such thing as a black community nowadays. We have black folks in here and there throughout the place, well integrated, all kinds of Mexicans, Latinos, uh, Africans, from everywhere, Europeans, from all over the place. It's integrated, so there's no quote-unquote black community. Maybe a neighborhood here and there. So now we have, we have no power. The Jews kind of coalesce together, New York, the Hasidic Jews, throughout and New Jersey and places like that. Uh, uh, the, the Chinese have Chinatown. You listening? San Francisco, New York. You got it? What? Little Italy. Italians have Little Italy. Yeah. And so, where, where do we have? Little Cuba. You can go, you can go and list, make your list. But the point is that we don't have anything. Because we turn around, we, 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 wanna go, we, want, we want some cold water from downtown. Nothing wrong with that. I like cold water. But I like cold water anywhere. Now... He says you need to build a five-story building. The five-story building that he says you need to build is this. The first story, well, he says is this. Write it down. You need an economic story. I'm coming to a point. I'm coming to a point. You need an economic story. The first floor is economics. If you don't have an economy, if you don't have, if you don't have a business where you can generate a job, where you can hire somebody, or create a payroll, you do not have a business. If you have a business where you work for the business and you're the only one working for the business, you got a job. But if you hire more than two, two or more people, then you have a what? Business. Are you listening? You got a business. Now, he says you need to have a business. Now, you know what? The next thing he says you need to have? On the second floor, you need to have some, a political floor. I call it the first one's an economical floor, but he said an economy. You got to have an economy. Everybody got to be in business. And they all can't be car washing and cutting yards and doing hair. They got to be some kind of business that generates lots of income. Provide a service, solve problems, you make money. The second floor is the political floor. That is, why do you need business? Because in order for get to a politician to run for an office, listen to me now, in order for them to run for an office, they need to get, they have to conduct a, what you call a what? A campaign. Listen now. They have to have a campaign. The campaign can run from six months to, based on when the season starts, a year and a half out to a, up to the time when the election is held. Now, they got to compete against whoever. So they need financial support. Now, we, personally, I'm telling you, all my life, I have never given a politician a dime. I give all my money to God. But I had to come to reconcile the fact with my knowledge of the scripture and change my ways. So, we, and only in recent years that we started donating here and there to that. So, I, 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 because we were giving 10% to God plus. So everything I give, we're going to give it to the Lord's work. That was a, because I was a pastor, that's what I was doing. And I still am. We are still doing that. But he said, so then we don't have anybody who is running for office, who represents our interest, because we are not giving them a penny. And so the ones who do run for office have to go across town and beg and scrape and borrow and press the flesh of everybody just to get a dollar to help their campaign be successful. So when they get in office, they don't recall us. We're glad to see them in power like... Uh, Joseph's brothers were glad to see him, but who helped them to get elected? So who are they going to answer to? So we come to Black Lives Matter. 
And you wonder why things don't change. Because the people we have in office, we didn't even help get there. You say, well, I voted for them. Yeah, that's at the end. But they had to get there. We can have more people running for office if we help them run. Help them run. So they need some money to run. To just to fight off their tax and so they won't have to kiss everybody's behind on the way to the office. And then they have Christian values that, that represent you. And then we don't vote for them because uh, it's like going downtown integration, you know. That's another thing. But, and then we vote. So, he, he said, this, so, you, so the, you need an economy. And you need to have a business. The, the second thing is the economy. And the first thing is the economy. Because now you have some discretionary money that you can use to what? To give to Walter Campbell. In addition to giving to God. Because some people who give to campaign ain't no church nowhere and ain't giving a dime to nothing. So they can have money left over, but then you're giving a tenth of everything. And then you're living and then you want to give some. You, the Lord will help you to do it if you desire to do so. And the third thing he says you need to have is uh, the courts. Because the judges will do what the laws on the books say. So if we have enough politicians elected, they will then pass laws and they can deal with the courts and, and change the laws and the regulations so that the courts will have to abide by them. And the courts, this judicial ruling that, uh, that uh, what you call it, immunity, qualified immunity, just let the cops do almost what they wanted. There's some good, good policemen, by all means, don't get me wrong. But there's some rotten ones in there too. And Derek Chauvin, in my opinion, was a, is a poster child that represents the hate in the hearts of many in this country. And he stood there until the man was dead and refused to move, and it exposed the real nature of racial hatred, what we call ethnic hate. There's only one race, Acts chapter 17, verse 26, but this is ethnic hatred. One ethnic group hates another ethnic group. So the courts will change if the legislation will change. The legislation will not change unless the legislators change. The legislators will not change unless we help get them elected. We can't get them elected because we don't have any money. And the money we do have, we ain't going to give it to them. Because we got this partisan politics thing. And we say, well, now, well, if you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, we can't support you, whatever your situation is, as if God cares. If I regard iniquity in my heart as a Democrat, God ain't going to hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart as a Republican, God ain't going to hear me. So you gotta you got to support people who represent and support and stand up like Joseph did for the interest of of God and the people of God in Egypt. Number one, you have to have an economy. Out of the economy, you can make donations to a campaign. Once you deal with the political, you can deal with the political, we'll deal with the courts. The courts, after you deal with the courts, then you have to deal with the, uh, the next thing, is the mass media. The media, which we call the, uh, the uh, broadcast, net, the 10 spies broadcasting network. We call it the Ten Spies Broadcasting Network. Andrew Womack says that. It's called the Ten Spies Broadcasting Network. In other words, all they do is broadcast what the Ten Spies say. We can't do it. We're scared. We got to go home. We can't run. We're going to die. We're going to get. Why sit? We're going to die. We can't go. We can't, we can't take the land. We'll see ourselves as grasshoppers. We can't do nothing. We need to just stay here. And then lastly, he says, so the reason we don't have any, any radio stations, we have one here in town. The reason we don't have any radio stations, because radio stations, like television stations, live on advertising. And the advertising comes from people who have businesses to advertise, to promote, so they can increase their flow of traffic in their business. So we have no businesses, so we can't contribute to a radio station with ads to advertise our business, so we don't have any radio stations. Under 1% of all the everything in this country is less than... Three is three quarters of one percent black media. 
So we, our, the one stadium, radio station we were close to owning, which I inquired about buying about 20 years ago, close to owning, when you, we, it sold. The one. And so he says, lastly, it's education. So we, the, the radio station don't exist because we ain't got no money to buy up. We have nothing to advertise. Secondly, the last, fifthly, he said, we need the education. So we turn the thing backwards. So the last floor is your education. We say, you need to get an education. So you borrow all this money, you get this degree, you owe all this money, then you come out and go and get your job. The job you go is a white man's job, and he's going to determine your worth and the value of your education by telling you what they're going to pay you for the job and the degree that you have. They control you getting an education, now they control you getting the job. So the last thing you need is education. I don't mean it like it sounds, but I'm telling you like it is. Because you don't need to get a college degree on a formal education in order to be successful in life. The old saying was, I may not have rubbed my head on the college wall, but I ain't no fool. So you don't need it. And there are people who, and pe the people, there are people with PhDs who are waiting tables. And they don't work in the field of their endeavor. Only 20% of businesses in America have leaders or presidents of companies who have advanced degrees. Most of them started working. Started a business. Even uh, Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of Harvard. Hey. George Jenkins with Publix. I don't know what kind of background he had, but he started a grocery store. And everybody rushed to get a college degree. But they have no business. And all we can do is turn around and go and get a what? Job. And they put a cap on what you can make. And so we produce after our own kind. So who taught us? Teachers taught us, so we turned out to be what? Teachers. Well, whoever taught you, that's what you're going to end up kind of turn out to be. So we produce a lot of teachers, a few doctors, some attorneys here and there, based on who kind of influenced your life to a degree. But influencing us to a, you know, business-wise, well, that's where we need to go. So that's what Dr. Claude Anderson teaches, and he talks about that. Now I want you to look at a scripture with me. Ever wonder what the best environment, the inv what, is, what is the best investment you can make? I am not in the business of giving financial advice to a degree, but I wanted to share with you this secret that every billionaire and large corporation in this country knows. The best investment you can make isn't in gold or some revolutionary technology, but the best investment you can make is to buy a politician. Investing in a politician can yield more returns than any stock or other commodity ever could. You see, when it's, it's illegal to buy a politician, you're right, it's called collusion and corruption. So I don't mean it literally as what you say, buying a politician, that's against the law. But you have to, if, if I help you to get somewhere, remember, uh, when, when you get to where you, he said, remember me, Jesus, the, the, the man said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Dr. Ira Hilliard said this to uh, his wife, Bridget. He said, now, when they was laying tile in the old church, he said, now, Bridget, if you just keep working with me, I'm going to make you my, king, my queen. I'm going to make you my queen. While they laying tile, when they didn't have anything, they were working together. And they worked together, and they kept working together. And guess what he did? He fulfilled that promise to her. Whatever he can help her get, is, but they had to work together. So people who help you get where they trying to get to will always remember you and will always want to do you a favor of kindness in return. So did you buy that person? No. You helped them. But in a sense, spiritually speaking, they feel like they owe you something. I've been in that same situation here in this ministry. We have people working in the ministry here so much. Two people in two families in particular, not a dime ever paid a penny they worked in their ministry, in children's ministry, and they worked 25, 35 years just straight. Not a penny from the ministry because we were trying to grow in everything else. And as, I, as time changed, I said, the Lord, and the Lord blessed me and my wife. I said, well, when we, we became a little more prosperous, and I said, well, who, like David did. And he said, 
when he came into his, and the Lord had given him peace all around and had uh, uh, silenced and destroyed all of the enemies that were around him, then he had peace in his own heart. He said, now, who is it from Saul's house, John said, who is it that I can show some kindness to? Who can I be nice to? Who is it that I can go back and repay? Because in a sense, they helped me so much until they almost bought me. I feel like I almost, I owe them something. Have y'all ever been there? Where somebody really helped you so much until you, they, don't, they don't know you feel this way. But you do. You know you owe them something. In your heart, you know you owe them something. They bought you all right. They bought you. But they bought you with their service. They bought you with their help. They bought you with their support. And so he says, now money can't buy you revelation. You can be dumb as a chinch. <laughs> money won't do that for you. But money will be an indication of your wisdom. It can help you out. But remember, Abigail, Abigail had a fool for a husband, but he was rich. So being rich doesn't immune you from foolishness. Okay? Now, I want to talk to you about this buying and selling. I want to, before I do that, I want to look at Matthew 28, 15, 28, 11, 28, 11 down to 15. Now, 28, 11, uh, sometimes people can buy you like this. They can buy you silence. Now, while there's 28, 11, now while they were going beyond, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had, been, that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave large sums of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we were sleeping. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they were bought. They took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews to this day. When somebody tell you, I'm going to give you this here, but don't you tell nobody. They're trying to buy your silence. Now, I could go off into a whole lot of other areas because there are about 12 or 14 areas because I can deal with buying and selling. I can deal with asking and taking. Number three is bribes and gifts. Number four is wages and spending. Number five is giving and receiving. Number seven is bringing from and taking to. Number seven is coming in and going out. Number eight is coming from and going to. Number nine is crossing over and crossing under. Number ten is driving out and driving in. Number eleven is dwelling in it or it dwelling in you. Number twelve is giving, given to you or taken from you. Number thirteen, possessing it or it possessing you. And number fourteen is earning or trading. But today I want to deal with one in particular. I want to deal with buying and selling. Are you ready? Turn with me, if you will, to Proverbs 33 and verse 22. Listen to your father who begot you. And do not despise your mother when she is old. Verse 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Wisdom, by, also by wisdom, also by instruction, and also by what? Understanding. You can buy what you want. You can buy these things. This is Proverbs 30, 23, and verse 22 and 23. So buy the truth. What is the truth? The truth is that if you have what I need, Publix, a grocery store, or whatever the grocery store you want to talk to, Walmart, or whatever, whatever, if they have what I need, the truth is what you want is over there. So you're going to go and do that. You're going to go and get it. So you buy it. You're going to go and buy what was true. They told you the truth. You went and got it. They had it and you, you, you got it. So you buy the truth. You don't sell it. You can lease it. We'll come to that in a minute. Now, Genesis chapter 41, verse 55. Genesis 41, 55. So when all the land of Egypt was famished. This is 41, 55. The people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all of the Egyptians, go to, go to Joseph. Whatever Joseph says to you, do. Verse 56. The famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all of the storehouses 
and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt, verse 57. So all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all the land. Go to chapter 47. Chapter 47 and verse 13. Here it is. Now, there was no bread in all the land. 47.13. For the famine was very severe. Y'all think the recession of 2008 was bad? So that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. 47.14. And Joseph gathered, because, you know, he had a dream, and he, in his dream, God gave him the ability to interpret dreams, and he could interpret the, he told him that he, the, the, the Pharaoh had a dream, and he didn't know what it meant, his magicians couldn't tell. So Joseph told, his, uh, he told him that what the dream meant, you're gonna, there's going to be a seven years of famine, there were seven lean cows, seven fat cows, you know the story. So he, he said, well, who can they put over this? He said, let the Pharaoh put somebody over this who can manage this. So if somebody come and interpret your dream, you would think that you would put that one over it, right? right? So that's what Pharaoh did. Since you interpreted the dream, you take care of it. I learned that. When people were going to bring something for me to do, God showed it to them, you do it. Then I we need you to do it. You'll get that in a minute. And Joseph gathered all the money. So during the seven fat years, prosperous years, here's where you don't spend all your money. Don't pay extra on your mortgage. Here's another thing. When you got your mortgage payment, don't just pay just the amount. Add two or $300 to it. They got a car note, don't just pay just the amount for seven years. Add a hundred and two or three hundred dollars to it. You got a credit card, don't just pay the ten dollars a month. So Joseph gathered all of the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. Because he just bought all during the during the prosperous years, he bought it all up. He bought it all up. Because the fools are they wasting theirs. So Joseph brought, brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Say Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh. Verse 15. So, listen to this. Unline this in your Bible. Because people don't believe me when I tell them. What does verse 15 say? So, when the money failed. That happened in 2008 when money was no good. Houses was just... We even bought a house for $128,500, a three-bedroom, two-bath house. Because it was a subprime loan, it just, it, and it was a, a high interest rate, and uh, it was a mortgage-backed security, and they couldn't modify the loan, so we had to let it go back through foreclosure. We had seven of them things because we didn't know about the mortgage-backed part of the security, and they couldn't modify it, so we had to just let it go. And we had uh, seven units like that. We had 64 units at the time. We went down to 50, 14 units. We had to go back, went back this way. And so uh, three months later, so we went on back, marched right there, went on back to the courts and gave it back to the owners. Said we tried to make it work, but it didn't work. So I let it go. Let the house go back. A month or two later, my son-in-law called me on the phone, tell the office, the office called me on the phone and said, uh, Daddy, isn't the house that you and Mama have out on Lemon Lane, uh, isn't that 611? And told me, yeah. They say, well, it's on the market. I say, what is on the market? They say it's on the market for $32,000. I just bought the, market, the thing last year for 128 They bought it for $32,000, the same house. Don't you tell me money can't fail. We had a duplex down here on, on Crutchfield Road. We owed $198,000 on it. 95, no, 90 something, or 90, whatever, 100, whatever it was. More than that, it was, it was 100 something. Make a long story short, they couldn't modify it. And so we went to court. That's the first piece we had. We, sent it, we went to court. We told the judge, the judge, he says, is this your property? Yes. Do you own it? Yes. Can you pay for it? No, judge, we can't pay for it. So Karen and I went to the courthouse and went to the judge's chamber with the bailiff. And we gave it back. I said, judge gave it to him. We came out of the post, out of the bank. When the, we had got a letter in the mail. And the letter said, oh, Mr. Lady, we'd like to work with you on this property. I called him on the phone and said, no, we don't own it no more. It's yours. They said, oh, no, Miss Lady, you still own it. I said, no, we just, just left the courthouse. You own it. It's your property. We don't own it. We done with it. We done. We done. We going through this here. And the judge, they, they said, oh, no, you still own it. You have to board it up and keep it safe. And they said, well, I said, no, it's y'all. The judge just signed the paper. They said, well, no, it's yours. You have to keep it until it is sold. I said, I'm supposed to be responsible for something. It ain't mine. 
They say, well, what do you want to do with it? I say, we want to keep it. They say, well, what would you do with it? How much would you, how would you, I say, well, I have to beg, borrow, and say, how much would you give for it? I say, I don't know. I ain't got no money. I have to beg and borrow and steal and try to get a dime every way I can to try to get some money for it. Well, how much do you think you could get for it? I say, maybe 30 or 32,000. I don't know. Oh, 110 or something, 15, like that. I say, I don't know. He said, well, well, put that, put that in a hood one statement. Uh, get a title company, put it in a hood one statement and send it to us. We bought that property right back for $32,000. $32, they gave us a tax write-off, uh, uh, a miscellaneous tax thing, said we had income of $76,000. So 76 plus 30 is 100, what it was. So we got that back. Money can fail, my friends. And when that man, oh, in, in, in Kings, where it says, I think it's in Kings, where it says, uh, when the prophet told the king, by this time tomorrow, a pound of dugs of dove fertilizer would be worth a quarter. The man, the armor barrel, the king did not respond to the prophet. But the armor barrel, with his smart behind, said to the prophet, without permission from the king to speak, he said, if this thing could be, God would have to open the windows of heaven if this thing could be. The prophet said to the armor bearer, not to the king, oh, it's going to be all right, but you won't live to see it. Because it happened, and the, you have to read the story, and it happened that he was trampled because everybody was trying to get to where the blessing was. He lost his life. Money can fail. Watch this. So when the money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread. Let's read together. Give us bread. For why should we die in your presence? Read. For the money has failed. Say that again. For the money has failed. Verse 16. Then Joseph said what? Give your stock. You give your livestock in exchange. Uh, you know, nothing is free. Give, your li give me your livestock. Give me your animals, your cows, your goats, and your pigs, and everything else you got. You give them to me, and I will what? And I will give you bread for your livestock. I'll feed. I'll give you bread for your livestock. How long is that going to last? It's like your stimulus money. If the money is gone, he said, and I'll give you bread if the money is gone. Because the money going to go. Read verse 17. So they brought their what? Livestock to Joseph. Now they, lose, they are giving with their business. The, the business is the means. That's what people say. Well, I would get me an old rental house, but I don't want the headache. That's going to be money for the rest of your life. And you can give it to somebody and, you know. I don't understand, folks. So they, everybody needs a house, right? So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph what? Gave them what? Bread. Gave them bread. I'm, uh, here we go. Watch this now. In exchange for, their ho for the horses, the flocks, what? The cattle of the herd, and what? They done sold everything that makes money. Then what? He fed them with bread in exchange for all their what? Livestock uh, that year. If they had kept it, they'd had it every year. Verse, read, read verse 18. When that year had ended, this is the second thing, they came to him the next year and said to him, what? We will not hide from my Lord that our money is gone. My Lord also has our herd. You already have our livestock and our herds. There's nothing. Listen, read. Let's read. There's nothing left to what? In the sight of my Lord, but our bodies... And our land, verse 19, read, everybody. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Guess what they said, what? Come on, you're not strong enough, what? Buy us and our land for some bread. There are people in this country who would rather get a check from the government than to believe that God can prosper them with a vision in their lives. They say, buy us, so you can buy people. The government bought these people, and they're doing it today. I'm just going to go out on this limb. I may as well. You know, I don't mind. You know why these folk, they're not doing anything about these folk coming across the border? Because it is necessary to keep a young population. The birth rate in America is slowing down. 
the people are getting older, and they're not having children like they used to do. And it, it, uh, uh, and Ireland is in bad shape. They say in 25 years there will be no more country because they are not having any children at all, hardly. And the birth rate is not is one point is less than one point one point six children per woman of childbearing age, and the country is dying. Canada is the same way. So they let all these young folk of childbearing age come through because they need them to start having babies because they can have somebody to work. But black folk are going with Planned Parenthood and destroying their babies. And we used to be the second large, com large community of blacks, the minority, the second in the minority. Now the, the Latinos and Mexicans have come in. We fall in the third place. And now the Chinese are coming, and we're coming to fourth place as a minority group in the country. So they need the babies, to come, the young folk to come on, and therefore is pushing us down as far as their majority with influence and power. Well, they ain't going to change. I mean, it's a big world, you know, but I'm just saying it's happening in our country. And we are killing our own babies. We are killing our own children, our own people. And in the church, I, 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 I have repented because the church we grew up in would always shame that girl. She got pregnant, and then they say, out of wedlock. Bring her, drag her before the church. Have her to repent before the people. And then nobody's going to put up with that. She got married. God knew it and he was a witness. They just didn't go down to the courthouse and get the license. But he knew when they were married. A man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife and they shall become one flesh. That's how when they got married. And most of us most of us and all of us probably got married before we ever got the license. But we're hypocrites. We are known for being hypocritical and judgmental and two-faced and backbiting and liars. Put somebody on the front of a church and wonder why they don't want to come. <laughs> it hurts the person. That's not the love of God. The child, we used to call the child illegitimate. There ain't no such thing as an illegitimate child. Children are an inheritance from the law. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. Yeah, but they didn't get the courthouse. They didn't go to the courthouse. These Pharisees or something. They say, buy us and our land for bread. Just, to, but just take care of us. Give me a check. Just buy me. And we and our land will serve, be a servant of Pharaoh. Just give us the seed to plant every year that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. Verse 20. Then Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh with a government program. A government program bought all of the people, put them all in public housing. For every man of the Egyptians sold his field. Don't you ever sell your property. Sold his field because the famine was severe. Hard times. Essence Magazine sold itself. Black BET sold its business. When time, among black folk, when times get hard, we sell it. Because I know this right here, I, go, I might catch hell, but I ain't turning it loose. You got to know the history. Because if you don't know the history, you will repeat it. So, and the Egyptians sold the field because the famine was so big in the land. So the land became what? Pharaoh's. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Verse 21. And as for the people, he, guess what he did? He what? He moved them into public housing where? In the city. From one end of the border of Egypt, what? To the other border. They owned everything, like in some of these co communist countries. Verse 22, only, read, only the land of the priest he did not buy, for the priest had, what, rations allotted to them by Pharaoh, and they ate their rations, which, what, Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, what, they did not sell their land. If you're going to be a priest, you can't be bought by the government. And he made us kings and priests to our God. In Revelations 1, 5, and 6, he made us kings and priests. You are a king and you are a priest. Sons of God spiritually by faith. We're all kings and priests. 
And so you can't be bought. Don't let the government buy you out for a check. You get a vision for your life. You can get a vision for your life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You say, well, I, 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 things are hard for me. I, all you need is a vision. All you need is a vision for your life. I don't care how tough it is. I don't care how hard your situation is. You can dream your way out of, into success and victory. Because the greater one, the creator, lives in your heart by faith. And when you pray, he said, you pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Let God arise and let the enemy of poverty be scattered. And he made us kings and priests unto our God, verse 23. And Joseph said to the people, indeed, now here's Pharaoh talking. He said, indeed what? I bought y'all. I have bought you and your land. So and as I was sitting, the Lord told me, if a politician can buy the people, then the people can buy the politician. Well, that's what I meant last Sunday. But we err because we don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. He bought them. That's why I don't let, no, don't let nobody promise, don't let no government official promise you anything. And you, what they hold them accountable. What are you going to do for my group of people? Hold them accountable. In other words, if you're going to buy them, you need to know what you're buying. You're going to give to that campaign. What are you going to do for us? And so we have just, all we have been for years and years, we just vote. And we don't ask for anything. He said, I bought you. I bought you and your land this day. I bought you who? For Pharaoh. Not for God. That's why the church is independent. Look. Here's the seed for you to plant, and you shall sow the land, verse 24. And it shall come to pass in the harvest, you shall give what? 20%. 20% to Pharaoh. Y'all think you got taxation now? You, 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 know what you know what you're paying? You're paying, if you just got a job, everybody talks about the middle class. You know why they get so much, they talking so much about the middle class? Because everybody in the middle class got jobs. And the tax burden of 7.65% Social Security and Medicare is up to $130,000 of income. So if you're under $137,000, you're paying 7%, 7.65% taxation on Social Security. That's just Social Security. Now, you ain't getting nothing for it until you get, if you live to be to 65, to get it. It's a Ponzi scheme. And then you got 15 to 28% bracket on top of the 7 if you make up the 400. You ought to, you ought to see the bracket. And some of y'all don't have anything but a job, and you pay through your nose. When all you need is a business, and you can get every dime back, except your Social Security. Every year from now on. That's just one way of the seven ways to make money. That's Goliath, my friend. Remember Saul? Whoever kills him, I will enrich I will give him my daughter to be married, and I will exempt his family from taxation for the rest of, for the rest, for the, for the, for the generations to come. So, you're going to give 20% to Pharaoh, but we don't want to give 7.65. We don't even try to get the 15 to 28% back. We dumb. We just pay it, roll over dead, like we vote for a politician, ask for nothing, and just get nothing, and continue to do the same thing over. Around and say, we need some businesses, we need, to, uh, we need to deal with the politicians, we need to support people who run for office. And especially when they're Christians. Especially when they're Christians. Amen. And get out of town, well, the political, you put, the, what side you're on, do they represent your God? Who you pray to every day? Don't tell me about no party. Show me it in the Bible where there's a Republican or a Democrat. If somebody is holding up the, the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ and standing up for the values that we hold dear to our lives, how dare you come bringing up some political divide and expect God to work on your behalf to show himself strong on your behalf when you want to advance his cause in the earth? Fourth 
fulfilled shall be your own as seed for the field and for the food, for those of your household, and as food for your little ones. So they said, hey, you saved our life. Let us find favor now. Let us kiss up the Pharaoh. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord. And we'll be Pharaoh's servants. And we'll be Pharaoh's servants. As long as they give me a check for $732, I'll serve Pharaoh. Proverbs 29, 18, without a vision, the people will perish. Without a revelation, without some kind of insight, there's a way to live that can change your destiny. You don't have to always be on hand. Hasn't he chosen the pool of this world to be rich in faith? You can prosper, my friend. You can prosper. You can change your destiny. You can change your future. You can't change. I'm talking to somebody. You can change your future. I don't care whether you're black in America, white in America, red, yellow, or brown. Whatever your ethnic group is, if you got a vision for your life, and it is never too late. He said, I'm just old now. I start, hey, you'll have something to do. 26, and Joseph made it a law in the land of Egypt to that day, to this day, that Pharaoh should have one-fifth except the priest, except for the land of the priest only, which did not become Pharaoh. The church. The church does not belong to the government. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So what I'm sharing with you all is that if we can be bought and the government can buy you for a dollar using some kind of federal program, you ought to have enough courage in your own conviction to not allow yourself to be bought and say, no, I'm going to buy me some politicians. I'm going to help some get elected. I'm going to help them because they're going to represent my God. And I'm going I'm to fight for them and help them because they represent my the interest that we have as, a, as, as believers. There are enough heathens screwing up the world now. Why you vote for somebody who you know? They're totally against what you pray for. But you can't bring yourself to divorce yourself from a partisan divide because of your bias, position, or whatever. You have to vote what's in your heart. And if it's in your heart, that's what you got to do. For as a man so thinketh in his heart, so is he. And if I regard iniquity and elect lawless people who pass a law and say, well, marriage is between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. Yes, not only that. Oh, we're going to abort every baby. We're going to go back and refund Planned Parenthood. Oh, yeah, we're going to do it all. Uh, no, no, no. If I regard this kind of iniquity in my heart, then I put myself in a position where God, it's hard for God to hear me. I ain't for that, my goodness. I, that's why I tell y'all, Isaiah 33, 22, the Lord is my king. The Lord is my judge. The Lord is my lawgiver. Is he yours? Is he your judge? Is he your king? Is he your lawgiver? Or you get yours every four years. So I, I had to repent myself. I had to make up my mind that I would use some of our money to assist and help some person who is running for a public office who represents the interests of my God to help them to try to be elected to help represent our interest. And then when you walk up in there and you see Joseph in part of his house, oh, they recognize you because you did him a favor. And sort of like you bought them, you owed them, they owe you. And they'll hear you and respond to you. And if we had some people who we bought by helping them to get elected in office, these laws would have changed a long time ago. This Black Lives Matter and all this killing and stuff, no, 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 it would have changed. It would have changed. Only taking some political will. But we ain't got nobody. Who's willing to stand up for this ethnic cleansing? So, no, you got to change your view. Change your mind. I encourage you. 
or whatever your political divide is, you have to leave that stuff at the altar. Get rid of that stuff. You got to vote your conviction and support. And where your treasure is, God proves it. Where your treasure is, that's going to be. That's going to prove where your heart really is. Amen. Please stand your feet. I hope you all got something out of this. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, I had to work on that one. Woo. I think we need to repent. I think one of the reasons black folk as a whole, as a people, have gotten a bad deal. Am I on? Can you hear me? All right. Is that we just not only, I guess you might say, elect the wrong people, they was just give them our vote. You know? We really need to, if I vote for you, I'm going to give you $1,000. But what you going to do for us? You find somebody, you say, well, they ain't black. Who cares what color they are? Are they going to do what God calls for and what you'd stand for? They don't matter what color they are. You got to get out of this flesh and blood, red, yellow, black, white, and brown. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And we got a man right here. I tell you what, he'll stand up. He'll stand up. He got more courage than me. But he'll stand up. At least he'll represent the Lord. And you'll be surprised at how, what he stands up for in places of power. I don't see how he does it. It ain't for me. But I appreciate him. Y'all pray for him. And though as the Spirit leads y'all, You got it? Yeah. And then we need to find other people. And then these laws are changed. Nothing going to change for us unless we hold somebody accountable for our votes and our money. And if we don't help them to get where they need to be to help us, why should they even think about helping us when they are accountable and have been bought by somebody else? So you got five dollars, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, a thousand, whatever you can do. You can support whoever the Lord tells you to support. Amen? Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do honor you and we praise you. That this nation can change. For your word declares, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear all the way from up in heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. We honor you, Lord. We thank you that you will let us live long enough to see your hand in the land of the living. To come into a position where we can effect change for the kingdom. To wield some power and influence using our votes and our wallets and our purses and our money our energy and our resources that we can change things just like it was in 1865 during reconstruction when 25 percent of legislatures were black father raise up some people in this ministry in this ministry and in this town but primarily in this ministry to run for office to hold public office to stand up for the values of Christ put it in their hearts for the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he'll direct them 
We honor you, Lord. And protect them and fight. We fight for them. But we are your people. We love you, Lord. And if it were not for the church in the world, the devil would take over. But I thank you that we, through our faith, restrain the evil that's really in the world. And we're your hands. We're your feet. We're your mouth. We're your eyes. You need us. We thank you, Lord. Help us to change our minds. Change our attitudes. Look at things a little bit differently. So we will be mistaken because we don't know the scriptures. Therefore, we cannot access the power of God. We praise you and we thank you. For this time together in the name of Jesus. Thank you for healing today. Deliverance. Sound mind. You said you sent your word and you cast out these spirits with a word. I think today I've cast out some religious spirits, some political spirits, some spirits of ignorance, hatred, resentment, narrow-mindedness, and bigotry. We cast it out in the name of the Lord Jesus. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For this we thank you. And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the communion of the Holy Spirit, but the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself is the love of God manifested in Jesus Christ. Union of the Holy Spirit. Rest. Lead. Guide. And direct. Undertake. Overrule and superrule. By the word that you have given us. As the foundation for our lives. In the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody say amen. amen. Say amen again. Say the man, if you're happy, if you're happy, and you know it, say amen, say amen. If you're happy, and you know it, say amen, amen. When the Spirit is in you, make you shout hallelujah, if you're happy, and you know it. If you're happy and you know it, if you're happy and you know it, say amen. If you're happy and you know it, say amen, say amen. If you're happy and you know it, God bless y'all. Have a wonderful Memorial Day and enjoy your time away. God bless you.